Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. Um, this morning, uh, Nancy Almacher is going to help me with our call to worship. And so I invite you, you can turn to it in your bulletin or um, just follow along on the screen. But welcome to worship this day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And um, I'll ask, invite you to respond to the bold. So, God of mystery, you called Ananias by name, and he responded, Here I am. You called Paul to the work of your church, and he responded, By giving his life to your word. Similarly, you call us into community and faith. So we respond with love and time, energy and hope. We respond with worship. Let us worship the God of transformation and grace. Amen. And now for our prayer of confession, which is also um, has some back and forth. God of new life, what would we give to have you appear with a flash of light and a clear voice like you did for Saul? Maybe then our doubts would disappear. Maybe then we would live as you called us to live. However, when our lives depend on faith, we forget your surprising grace. Instead, we draw lines around enemies and friends, who's in and who's out. We see the other faster than we see our neighbor and refuse second chances. Pull the scales from our eyes. Help us see as you see. Help us live as you live and forgive us when we fail to. Humbly, we pray. Amen. Amen. And um, here's a quick snapshot. I'm going to um, stop the share for a moment, but this is the image today that's in our Unraveled um, study journal, the image of Saul on the road to Damascus, and when he was healed, um, something like scales fell from his eyes. So hold this image um, as we listen to scripture and um, before I do the scripture reading, I um, join your hearts with me in this prayer for illumination. God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, Clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. So I'm reading this from the NRSV today. And for the kids, we um, thanks with, for help from Nancy. We know it's page 514 in the Spark Story Bible, if you want to read along there. So this is our story today from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, 
And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. All right, so we'll start with this with uh, activity for the kids, but any age can play along too. Um, so remember the game peekaboo, right? Close your eyes, peekaboo. Yeah. Um, the best part is when you uh, can teach the kid to play it themselves, right? Peekaboo. Um, <laughs> but uh, imagine that, right? When we close our eyes and put your hands over your your face. Um, Let's get dark, right? And now imagine what it would be like to lose your sight and how, how hard that might be to brush your teeth or eat some food or even just walk around, right? Um, and there are a lot of people today who live without their sight and they learn different ways to live and to move around. And today's story about Saul he lost his sight for three days, for three days, and he wasn't sure how long it was going to go. But after those three days, he opened his eyes and he could see again, and he saw the world in a different way. Now, um, like you can see in the story Bible, it says Saul to Paul, and those are the same name for the same guy, just different languages, Hebrew and Greek. And after this story today, after Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, we hear a lot from him. He started to visit a lot of different cities and tell them about Jesus and his message of love and forgiveness. And he wrote a lot of letters that we have in our Bible today. Before we go further, let's just take a moment and do a quick prayer. Um, if you want to, you can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, help us to see other people. Help us to see other people with your love, with your love. Amen. So to flesh out Saul's story a little bit, he was really mean to the Christians before that day on the road to Damascus. He was looking for ways to hurt them. Saul thought that he was right and that those who followed this Jesus guy were wrong and needed to be arrested. Then one day, God came to meet him. There was this flash of light, like kind of maybe like that lightning storm we had last night. And Saul heard Jesus, or yeah, Saul heard Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And persecute is another word for being mean and cruel. And Saul learned that it was Jesus saying this to him, that Jesus really was the son of God, the same God who Saul claimed to love. Now Saul, he had a direct experience with Jesus, right? This voice from heaven. Now how many of us have wanted to have that direct line to God, right? To literally hear God's voice. 
And now Saul's story reminds us that if that does happen, it's usually not what we expect, and it's pretty disruptive in our lives. And in Saul's story, he experiences that God's love is bigger than he imagined. Jesus interrupts our life to expand our idea of who is in and who is out. Now, Paul's friends had to help him get to Damascus because he couldn't see, right? And I wonder about what Paul thought about on those days where he was blinded and he couldn't see. He was probably scared and probably amazed because he had heard from God. Wow. Saul's worldview was cracked open by this encounter with Jesus. His certainty about who Jesus was was unraveled. His understanding of who was included was changed and expanded. He had to shed the hard ideas he had, and then he was in a place of reflection and vulnerability as he figured out what came next, and as he waited for a man named Ananias to come and give him back his sight. And Ananias, right? His view of who God, who was included in God's love was also unraveled because Ananias was understandably resistant to go to Saul. This was the guy who was coming into town, ready to arrest the followers of Jesus, breathing threats and murder against those who follow Jesus. You really want me to go to him, God? Really? And yet this story is not complete without Ananias's courage and following of Jesus's call as well. And when Ananias came to Paul, he prayed over him and put his hands on his head and something like scales fell from Paul's eyes. And I wanna go back to the painting that I had up before. So this is from our Unraveled journal and those who are on the, um, the telephone, we see a hand that has sort of that saint halo behind it reaching out to a man whose eyes are closed. And then it looks like, I, I sort of picture it like a waterfall of blue and gold scales falling from his eyes. And when I saw this picture, I thought, oh, I hadn't, I thought like, you know, maybe a couple of scales or, you know, whatever. But this image of an overflowingness, like how much did, did Saul have to give up, right? He was, he'd been carrying years of prejudice and hate, and there was a lot that had to fall off of him in order to see the world with new eyes. And Paul was experiencing this resurrection to new life because of Jesus. It also makes me think that um, our own unraveling or shedding of our beliefs is not always this visible, right? <laughs> Sometimes it'd be kind of nice if it were, but it's not. So turning it to us, when have you been so certain of being right? Where you knew what was true and then it wasn't. Something happened that disrupted what you thought to be so true and right. And a lot of times this is a movement from thinking either or to a both and, seeing more of the gray instead of black and white. And what are ideas about faith or Jesus or something else in life that you've had to unravel or shed in order to grow? I want to share with you an unraveling story I heard this past week from a pastor in our synod. It has to do with the justice teams that have been active in our synod for the past year. And for me, it also ties into the work I was doing before taking the call here to join you at the One in Christ Parish. So before coming here, moving to Greenwood, I worked for Lutheran Volunteer Corps, LVC. And LVC is a year long service program for young adults where they work in a nonprofit organization and live in a house community with other participants. And I oversaw recruiting, so I was talking to a lot of um, young adults about um, how God was calling them to use their gifts to serve others. And a significant part of the culture of LVC was our work to affirm and include LGBTQIA individuals in our, in our program and in the church. And a lot of our participants um, really appreciated having space for dialogue 
and getting to wrestle with their identity and questions. And one of the questions that come, came up often is, now what do all those letters stand for again? <laughs> so LGBTQIA stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual or aromantic. Now back to the story of um, back to the story of what happened this past week is that I heard from a pastor in a video, and this video was shared um, because it's going to be shared for our synod assembly next year. And there's a resolution coming before our synod assembly inviting 25% of our congregations in the Northwest Wisconsin Synod to have conversation about becoming a reconciling in Christ congregation meaning they'd actively welcome LGBTQIA persons. And this past week, I saw a rough cut of the video that will be used to introduce this resolution and conversation. And I share it to you today um, because as Pastor Steve spoke in that video, his story reminded me of Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, Steve served as a pastor in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod for over 30 years. And then a couple years ago, one of his sons came out as gay to him and his wife, and they weren't sure what to do. So they prayed, they studied scripture, they listened to their son, they learned, and they prayed some more. And through a lot of reflection and difficult conversations and wrestling, Steve and his wife experienced God's love and welcome in a new way, and Steve sought to serve a church where his son and his family would be welcome as their whole selves, and they found that in the ELCA. Now, Steve doesn't use language of scales falling from his eyes, yet as he spoke, that's what came to my mind, scales falling from his eyes so that he could see the hurt and pain that LGBTQIA people have experienced, often at the hands of the church, and the pain that he, as Pastor Steve, had perpetuated at times. And then he also saw the love that God has for all people as they are. And Steve has been public about his story because he says, if I can help one person or family see the acceptance and love of God for all, then I am reaching my goal. Now, I share Steve's convictions, um, though I've arrived there via my own journey through Bible study, college classes, and learning from friends and more. And I wonder what your story is. And maybe it mirrors Steve's. It's certainly one that I've heard a bit since coming to this parish. Words like my son or daughter or niece or nephew is gay or queer, and I'm dot, 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 one of these often one of these statements. I'm having a hard time learning what that means. Or it goes against what I was taught in church and growing up, yet I love them and I'm so happy to see them so happy and whole. Or I already knew this about them before they told me and I'm honored they're sharing it with me now. Or you, like many people, might be a mix of all of these responses in varying degrees. So where are you at, your kids, your, grand, your grandkids? What word of God's presence do they need to hear of love and accept, acceptance from God or from the church? And I'm got, not going to make you or force you to believe one thing or another, yet I do invite you to listen for both the pain and joy in people's stories. And if you want to learn more, um, particularly about LGBTQIA inclusion, check out reconcilingworks.org. That's an organization connected with Lutheran churches. Now, Steve's stories and thinking about stories I've heard um, here, not just about um, LGBTQIA inclusion, but many other spaces. What is the role of the church today, right? What should the church take a public stand on these days? And what do you expect to hear? I think too often in our public sphere today, the Christian voice is used for bigotry and exclusion and shame. As Christians, we are on the side of abundant life for all people and all creation. God does not love us because of our worth, 
We are of worth because God loves us. Now, Paul shared this abundant love and grace in the years after his encounter with Jesus on that road to Damascus. Half of our New Testament writings are from Paul and his followers. And here's a couple highlights. Some of the ones you might come to mind. We are saved by grace through faith. And there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free. We are one in Christ. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Paul shown a loving pastoral presence in his letters and time with communities. His harshest criticism came when people were excluding others in Jesus' name, or they put human requirements on the gift of forgiveness in Christ. And I think he came down so hard on them because he had been there. And then, once he experienced the freedom of Christ, that touching eternal full life right now, he wanted that for everybody he met. And this freedom has also meant boundaries and expectations on our behavior and how we treat one another as Christ would have us treat them. Because there are many places and things that can disappoint or distract us from this true life. When we place our trust in money or in power or position or loyalty or politicians or ideology, or we use those things as a lens to tell us who matters. Rather, our Christian trust is based in a love that was born in a child, lived out in a teacher who loved and taught with compassion, who was put to death as an enemy of the state, and then rose victorious over the grave. We get to put our hope and trust in a power beyond us that will never disappoint. And this message of new life, new sight, love of enemy, care for neighbor is for right now because God continues to do new things today. Can we see it? May our hearts and eyes, ears and lives be open to following the Spirit's leading. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll continue singing the song, Saul Left for Damascus. I'm going to pull up the lyrics. Um, and I'm going to play this on um, the speaker here.
Sorry for missing the advancing the slides. I got caught up reading <laughs> the hymn that was printed in front of me. Um, and um, we continue with the affirmation of faith. So I invite you to say this along with me. I believe in God, the great sower, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. Now, as we move to um, the prayers for one another, I um, wanted to share one um, update about Sue Johnson at Our Saviors. Um, she uh, had started chemo this past week and um, she went into the hospital last night because she was dehydrated. So it's nothing outside the normal of a response to that, but um, she's hoping to come home today. She wanted me to share that update. And we also continue to pray for um, a little more context for Joan Turnquist as well. Um, and some transitions going on with her, her dad to um, assisted living. And if you have any other um, prayer requests, you can um, put them in the chat or you can, could unmute yourself too if you wanna, um, if you have a prayer request. Uh, but otherwise, I invite you to join your hearts and minds with me, and I will end each uh, petition with, Lord, in your mercy, and have you respond, hear our prayer. Lord, we come before you, um, bringing all these prayers of our hearts and our community, knowing that you hear us. So today, Lord, we pray over those who um, continue to be on the front lines in um, the pandemic with our county, our county workers, those who have been diagnosed and are suffering from COVID-19 and those who are facing any other illness as well, Lord. We pray that they're able to get the treatment and care that they need in hospitals and clinics um, around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray over those who are serving our country in many different capacities as elected officials, um, in the military, in service organizations, AmeriCorps, any other service corps, Lord, um, Peace Corps. We pray that um, you give them wisdom and understanding, especially those elected leaders making big decisions, whether that's the president, our governors, our mayors, um, city council, all of those people, Lord. We ask that you um, guide them to see um, all of our, all humanity around the world as the beloved children of God that they are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray, Lord, for all those in our parish and our churches who need your healing presence with them. We pray especially for Denny and Tony, Betty, Kurt, Cindy, and Sue, Ruth and Katie, Debbie, Bernice, Cindy, Douglas, Bill, Brian, Anthony, Mary Jo, Sam, Roger, Don, Diane, Luke, and Jesse, and Joan's parents, and any others who are on our minds and hearts. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we also lift up to you Phyllis and Eileen Wilkins and any others who are in care centers or in the hospital. May your presence surround them and we pray over the caregivers who are there as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up all these prayers, um, again, trusting that you hear us and help us listen for um, the answers and how you are leading us to love our neighbors um, as, as you call us to love them. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll unmute for the sharing of the peace. So the peace of Christ be with you all. And all of you. Peace be with you. I think a lot of you um, have heard this song. And if it's unfamiliar to you, it repeats a lot. So um, by the end, you should um, be able to sing along. Sing along a bit. Okay. <laughs> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
please join me in this prayer um, after communion. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. We turn now to offering, and so you need that moment to write out a check or stamp, address your envelope right now. You can feel free to do that. Um, thank yous from last week. We um, did take a special offering for Luther Park, and I don't know the totals yet because the money just uh, just got counted. So thank you for your offerings to our church, to other uh, ministries and community places that you support as well. And as a reminder, um, one of the places you could go and share some offering is for um, kids and families who are doing the Simple Summer Vacation Bible School. One of the activities, I think day eight maybe, is going to take talk drawing and decorate the sidewalks at your church. So again, that could be people of all ages if you need a creative outlet. <laughs> we have plenty of sidewalk at all our churches that could use some decorating. I will pull up some more announcements for the week. Um, all right, so um, some of these dates have been in front of you a bit, but then say them again because it doesn't hurt to hear it more often. August 1st is a Vacation Bible School Day at Longwood Park. That's a Saturday from 10 to 1130. If you, um, if your kids or grandkids are coming to that, please let us know because we want to have counts for how many kids are coming. And we are doing a food drive. So there are, um, you can leave food at, um, in boxes or in coolers at each of the churches. And that goes to, we have a goal of collecting 1,000 items for our local food shelves. So anybody from the congregation can participate in that. And then Sunday, August 2nd, we have our outdoor worship at Longwood Park. And I forgot to announce this last week, the dates are set for Manuel's garage sale. So that's Wednesday and Thursday, August 5th and 6th, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then um, this Thursday is the last session for the Hebrew Bible in its historical setting. And, and then we're going to start the New Testament um, in August. And our summer book studies, our Waking Up White, started last Thursday. And if you're interested in coming, you're welcome to come. Um, on Thursday, July 30th is our next uh, meeting time. And then there's two summer book studies that the Synod is doing on Love Without Limits and She by Caroline Lewis. And then my Sabbath is now on Fridays, um, which I was put in the newsletter too. And this is probably the last Sunday I'll announce that separately. So receive this blessing. Again, some words of the Apostle Paul. Remember that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen.